How's that for sound? Good? Good? Well, rise and shine, friends. Thanks for getting here early and joining me at the Museum of Contemporary Craft this morning. I want to thank Celie Pines first for the invitation and the whole Creative Mornings team for really making this happen. So I'm going to be referencing a lot of books on education in this talk, so I put together a reading list. That can be found at the back of this scout book that were made to accompany this talk. Uh, they're going to be at the merch table after after the lecture, it's also going to be posted online for those of you who don't want to pick one of those up. So if you are also interested in these lovely pennants that were designed by Alex de Spain, if you like any of these photos that were posted on my Instagram feed in the past three weeks leading up to the talk, you could be entered into a draw to win one of these today. So get over there. So I want to start off this morning by having you turn your neighbor and introduce yourself and I want you to just take a minute to share with them the most important lesson you've learned in your lifetime. <laughs> All right. <laughs> conversations, some, some knowledge sharing. Can I get a show of hands? How many of those lessons exchanged were ones that you learned in school? It's kind of what I thought was going to happen, right? So I know that for myself, a large part of my own education came from participating in the local Winnipeg music scene, that's in Canada, uh, of the mid-90s. It was really infused with the spirit and energy of Riot Girl and DIY. And I know that how I work today is very much rooted in what I learned during those formative years as a show organizer, as a listener, creator of zines, and a band member. It's a picture of me on the skins over there. <laughs> I place a high value on what many might dismiss as an incidental education. I've had many other teachers in my life, some of which have come in the form of challenging experiences or people, usually linked. Um, and these are usually lessons that none of us ever ask for, but if we're open to learning from them, can be immensely powerful for personal growth. So for this talk today, I'm going to work on tackling the following questions. What should an arts education look like today? Can education change the role of artists and designers in society? How does teaching change when it's done with compassion? How does one navigate and resist the often emotionally toxic world of academia? And with the rising cost of post-secondary education in this country, what can we do differently? I think it's worth starting at the beginning. What is the impetus behind education? Where did it come from? And what is it for? 
The standardized education system that we know today comes from a historic societal base of industrialization and militarization. Since its formation, society has also turned to the school system to provide its citizens with critical lessons in socialization. As education critic Edgar Friedenberg wrote, what is taught isn't as important as learning how you have to act in society, how other people will treat you, how they will respond to you, and what the limits of respect that will be accorded really are. Radical approaches to education fundamentally believe that learning can teach us so much more. These schools of thought believe that education can liberate, empower, and assist in the creation of a more just world. I personally believe that the formal education system must serve in the creation of thoughtful, caring, and compassionate members of society. In preparation for this talk, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on my own formalized education. I encountered many teachers during my time in the school system, but these are the ones who really shaped the course of who I would become, and for the following, I'm very thankful. So in the first grade, I had Madame Horalition, Madame H. She was my cousin's next door neighbor, and I would spend a lot of time at my cousin's house and would often see Madame H in her driveway with her children, washing her car. I learned early on that teachers were people. In the fourth grade, I had Mr. Garcia, and I'm thankful that he treated me like an equal. I remember we once had this exchange where he was talking to me about why it was that I didn't smile very much in class. And somehow it ended up that in response, I wrote an essay for him about why I don't smile. And it was all about that I didn't want to project false fronts. It's like, I'm not going to wear a fake mask. I'm not going to wear the fake smiling mask. I'm being generous. <laughs> People need to know how we're really feeling. Um, so in the seventh grade, I had Mr. Howdle, and I'm thankful that he explained to all of us that if we want to be active and engaged citizens, we really need to learn how our country works. And in that same year, I had Mr. Reinhardt as an art teacher, and this quote really was so important and really made me want to become an artist. It said that art isn't about drawing, it's about ideas, and this was prominently displayed in the art room. In the 10th grade, I had Madame Nyon. She was a tiny woman who had a massive meltdown one day in class, just total frustration with the whole lot of us. And she yelled, you're all kidding yourselves if you ever think you're going to be bilingual. And I thought, that little lady's got a point. <laughs> and then the next year, I dropped out of the French immersion program and began to excel academically. And then in my, <laughs> right? We should all be honest. <laughs> No more false faces. <laughs> so in my BFA, I had uh, Sharon Allward, great mentor, and I'm thankful that she never taught drawing in her drawing class. <laughs> and then during my MFA, professors Rochelle Vieter Knowles and Randall Rogers, I'm so thankful to them for everything. I left that program feeling like they shared absolutely everything they had to give. So I'm thankful for that. Some of my most influential teachers have been people that I've never had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, the following three people have deeply impacted how and why I teach. The first is artist and activist Sister Carita Kent, and she inspires me to see the world anew and to share the gift of really looking with students. Each of you should have found on your seats this morning one of these viewers with a quote from Sister Carita on it, and this was inspired by an assignment that you'll see in this clip that she would often give to her students. She saw possibilities in you that you didn't know about yet. I went with her when she took students to the car wash and gave the directions, look at this and then look again and see anew and get rid of all your assumptions 
But I learned from Corita how to be open to everything, how everything can be a source of inspiration, how to see with new eyes. She had a lot of interesting, exciting projects for us. A lot of times we went off campus. We went to Charles Ames studio and we would walk around and observe the buildings in the area. Or we would go to a shopping area and observe the windows and the things in the windows. Or we would just walk along and observe the people. And then we would come back and uh, give our impressions of the people on paper, of course, sometimes cutting out, doing collages, uh, painting. She, we worked in a number of mediums. I used to see some of the people in our class going around with these square pieces of paper, you know, with, the, you know, with this little hole. And I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm doing my homework. And Karina said, you know, you have to look at the world, you know, small pieces at a time. Look at just a small part of the world. I think that was all part of her work ethic to just keep people looking because the first time we look at things, we don't see things. I think that's one of the things she tried to teach her students and future teachers is to really look and to really see things. That's a great gift to teach people how to, uh, to see, to really see, to look, to see. Inventor and visionary Buckminster Fuller remains my guide in resisting the impulse to become an expert and embracing failure as one of the greatest forms of education, valuing experiences that life gives us as lessons, and to see experimentation as the lifeblood of education. When only you can only unentitled to stay alive if you really commit yourself and all your experiences to, uh, to other human beings in a very, really complex, complete, out and out way. I told you how much impressed I was the principle, so that this idea of preceptionally of going off 90 degrees did not seem to be illogical to me. In fact, it seemed very logical, but it had never been tried. And so all my contemporaries are tied up with have to earn a living. And I said, I, I think this is just what we ought not to be doing. We ought to be saying, what do my experiences teach me needs to be done, which if not done, will find world society in great trouble, which if attended to, will find them in, in, in advantage. And what would I need to know in order, over above what I now know that made me see that that is so, what more would I need to know in order to be able to, to do something effective about it? <clears throat> I said, those are the kind of questions I thought we ought to be doing. And I. I then also then came to ask myself quite a number of other questions. And I said, the only condition then of your saying is that you are committed to the others, and number one, you have to do your own thinking. And spiritual leader, poet, and peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh for his wisdom, compassion, and love. I believe he's truly one of the greatest educators the world will ever know. And I'm about to share a clip of a young boy who asks uh, Thich Nhat Hanh about a problem he's having in the classroom, and his answer is just so moving. Dear Thai, dear Sangha, what should one do when a teacher makes fun of you in front of the whole class, and your class laughs about you? Very difficult. <laughs> I think the best way is to laugh along. <laughs> to laugh with the whole class to join the class and laughing. That's the most beautiful thing to do in that occasion. Because uh, some, sometime, uh, sometime uh, something is not, uh, is not funny, but people be, believe to be funny. There's a wrong perception. Maybe you will grow up and become a teacher. Mm. So we should prepare ourselves. <laughs> and not to do like that. <laughs> teachers need time to grow into a good teacher. It's not because you are graduated from teacher college, teacher's college that you can be a, a good teacher right away. Uh, so teachers can make mistakes, and Thay also made mistakes uh, as a young teacher. And he still makes mistakes. And what he learned every day, 
being a teacher, and he has learned so many, so much from his own own students. So, uh, not only teachers, but everyone should not make fun of uh, someone uh, because they will go suffering. Sometimes uh, it is not the intention to make you suffer, but because uh, that person lacks uh, some skillfulness, even when he like to, uh, he want to teach you. He can teach you in such a way that does not make you hurt. And that is something we have to learn, teacher or not. So uh, I've known that I've wanted to be an art teacher since the seventh grade. During junior high, I spent my lunch breaks in either the art room or in the library reading about contemporary art. I even did a strange participatory art project in my senior year of high school. And if presented with the choice in any class, I would always take the option to hand in an art assignment over anything else. I went straight from high school into a Bachelor of Fine Arts program, and then two years after that into a Master's of Fine Arts program. I saw my relationship with my peers as an opportunity to share knowledge and support one another, and not as one of competition. I loved meeting one-on-one -on -one with my classmates to give feedback, to talk about our work, and whenever possible, work together. I chose to be an educator. I didn't become an art teacher because I got the technical qualifications that I needed for a viable source of income. So soon after entering into undergraduate art school, I began to see major problems with the structure of education. And it became very clear, very fast, that the standard studio-based production model of creating works for a market-based gallery system was not going to support the vast majority of us art school graduates economically. Is art school just a temporary state of delusion? I mean, in this Dan Klaus comic from 1991, Art School Confidential, he illustrates the rarity of the art school instructor who's willing to level with students about their bleak prospects, stating that only one student out of 100 will find work in her or his chosen field. The rest of you are essentially wasting your time learning a useless hobby. The sad reality is, as Klaus puts forward, that many students who are in the system truly do believe that they will be that exception, that art school really will work for them. The New York-based collective of artists, designers, makers, technologists, curators, architects, educators, and analysts uh, analysts that make up BFA, PH, BFA, MFA, PhD, sorry, that is a mouthful. That is like <laughs> their own language and I really wanted to use it. So their research findings show that of all of the people in the United States who identify as making their living working as an artist, only 15.8% of those people actually are fine arts degree holders. Another problem with art school is often the perpetuation of the cult of originality, trying to do it first. Students become paralyzed creatively because everything has already been done. This is a mistaken interpretation of avant-garde, this constant need for originality and innovation. Without delving too deep, I believe that the historic avant-garde was really about the quotidian and making sure that art does not make the mistake of divorcing itself from life. In the system as it stands, students often become closed off and feel restricted from freely sharing their ideas or thoughts out of fear that someone might steal their precious original ideas. And I think that this unhealthy emphasis on originality makes students move in the direction of the frivolous, which is miles away from how philosopher and education reformer John Dewey beautifully described how the everyday can be the birthplace of meaningful originality. He wrote, originality does not lie in the extraordinary and fanciful, but in putting everyday things to uses which had not occurred to others. The next point I want to take issue with is the violence of critique. 
I've experienced almost every possible manner of viciousness and self-importance in art school critiques. It's a bizarre and uh, incredibly cruel forum often, and this is likely where 100% of any student's art school damage happens. It's like, if you went to art school, you're not, and you're like, yeah, that's, that's where they broke me. <laughs> so, Unfortunately, I think that often instructors can be the worst perpetrators in critiques. Unwittingly or not, uh, seldom do they place any rules of engagement for their students. And this is where this cycle of violence is perpetuated. Instructors often foster unhealthy and destructive environments of power and dominance instead of creating a space for growth and deep understanding. Another fundamental problem with art school is outdated curriculum. I often got flack from art school professors I would challenge during my BFA about assignments and approaches I thought were irrelevant. I didn't want to draw nudes and still lives. I didn't want to make a color wheel. When I pushed back for more applicable work I could be doing in my art education, I was once aggressively yelled at by a male professor who said, if you don't want to do what I tell you to do, then why are you even in art school? <laughs> Never asking to think himself, why was he teaching that way in an art school? I believe, as Canadian artist Ken Lum states, what students need to be taught is that art is about making everything in the world relevant. So my next issue is lack of critical care. When I say lack of critical care, I'm talking about two separate but equally problematic deficits. The first is a social deficit, the lack of a real emphasis on community building, as well as what I feel as an epidemic of teachers who lack a real investment in care in their students and the creation of learning communities. Second is a widespread lack of care and whether or not the curriculum has real value and application outside of an art world or art school context. Currently, most of the art programs that focus on socially engaged art are masters of fine arts programs. I believe that an artist's relationship to and placement in society should not be an area of specialization or an afterthought, but instead a core component of the education of all artists. But can education really change the role of artists and designers in society? And I think the answer to that is yes, but it means changing how and what we teach. I believe this change needs to happen first at a foundations level, and this fall, Carnegie Mellon University was the first art school to make this kind of approach to art making a foundations level requirement, right along things like intro to 3D design. Another incredibly promising and relevant undergraduate program is the newly formed Art and Social Justice Cluster at the University of Illinois Chicago. But you don't need the creation of an entire program to foster these ideas on how you teach art and design. How I teach is social. It's from a decentered position of power. It's about respecting and valuing the contributions of the group equally. It's about finding ways to make the work that we are doing as learners and makers socially relevant. And it's about having the contributions of students seen as valuable to multiple contexts. A friend and fellow artist and educator, Nils Norman, introduced me to the book Street Work, The Exploding School by Colin Ward and Anthony Fison. It had a major influence on how he teaches and it did the same for me. I'm going to share how that was put into practice for myself from 2008 to 2013 when I was co-directing an MFA program in art and social practice. I believe in learning in the world and that environment has an impact. This is an image from a field trip from 2011 where we went to see the works of Sister Corita Kent. We did site-specific readings on her work and then had public conversations in the space followed by those readings. That student interest can drive the direction of a class as well as their own course of study. This is an image of a site visit that was organized by a student who was interested in spiritual music. I know that being a listener is one of the most important contributions to the world. 
there needs to be a focus on teaching active listening. This is an image of me leading an engaged listening exercise that includes readings from Patti Smith's Just Kids that was paired with my musical thematic selections. You guys want to go to that talk next? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, understanding that we are bodies and not just brains is also important. Yoga, basketball, and walks were staples in the program. But maybe most important and even less emphasized is love. In 2010, I team taught a course with artist Mark Dion on museums. Mark also teaches at a prestigious MFA program in New York, and he commented to me on the difference between our cohorts. Our class uh, was less interested in reading the latest issue of Art Forum cover to cover, but the most noticeable difference was that they genuinely cared about one another. He was amazed at how generous the students were with each other and how much support they offered. There was a distinct lack of competition and with that came open communication, dialogue and resource sharing. While it's a hard thing to measure or to put a value on, I know that this atmosphere of care and the emotional IQ of the group was the most important and least publicized aspects of the program at that time. It's also the kind of thing that isn't built into a curriculum. It is set by example. It's our duty as teachers to model this. In Canadian education activist Satu Repu's publication, this book is about schools, there's an essay titled, If You Can't Love Them, You Can't Teach Them. And for me, this title just sums it up completely. If you're an educator and you're starting to feel hatred or resentment towards your students, it's time to step back and take a break and return with the capacity for care. The unfortunate reality of art schools and academia as a whole is that it's just not a place that's teeming with actualized, loving human beings. <laughs> Amer it's true, I, I didn't want to break the news to you guys, but it's just the way it is. Bell Hooks broke the news first. She's an American author, feminist, social activist, and public intellectual who herself has spoken about the emotional toxicity of the academy and why for her it was the right choice to distance herself from it and to not teach full time at any one institution. This quote from Hooks captures some of my own specific disappointments to a T. It was particularly disappointing to encounter white male professors who claimed to follow Paulo Freire's model, even as their own pedagogical practices were mired in structures of domination, mirroring the styles of conservative professors, even as they approached subjects from a more progressive standpoint. Yet it still came as a surprise to me when a progressive seeming tenured white male colleague enacted similar systems of dominance and oppression in our own working relationship, telling me after six years of working to build a socially engaged art program that I had become too visible and was taking too much credit for the work that I was doing. So I asked myself, <laughs> what would bell hooks do? And Luckily for me, I live in a time where texting a number for supportive quotes from Bell Hooks is an option. <laughs> Whenever domination is present, love is lacking. This exchange with this former colleague made it clear that this was no longer a program where I could teach from love or feel proud about the overall quality of the educational experience. To quote American educator and founder of the Highlander Folk School, Miles Horton, I think if I had to put my finger on what I consider a good education, a good radical education, it wouldn't be anything about methods or techniques. It would be about loving people first. The last problem that I'm gonna address in art schools is one of the biggest, it's the cost. Seven of the top 10 most expensive schools in this country are art schools. <coughs> How much would it cost if all of us in this room, about 100 people, received a BFA from the School of the Art Institute Chicago, a more expensive art school, one of the most expensive art schools, and an MFA from Portland State University, a lower cost state school? You guys ready? 
Even before adding interest on loans or cost of living expenses, both together would cost us $9,128,000. What other options could that money have if we thought about education differently? So many. So I want to propose some other ways that artists could approach their education, ways in which we take control, we work together, and shape knowledge collectively. In the words of, words of Miles Horton, you have to bootleg education. It's illegal, really, because it's not proper, but you do it anyway. I think that many people would be surprised to know that Oxford was started by rebel students from Paris. Cambridge by rebels from Oxford, and Harvard by rebels from Cambridge. <laughs> so if these schools, which were born of revolution, could become amo amongst the most revered sites of learning in the world, who's to say that other radical propositions could not be valued equally? The following is just a brief list of historic and contemporary approaches that other people have created as alternatives to standard art school education. Each one of these really could merit a whole lecture onto themselves, so if you're interested, I hope that you'll look at the reading list and just dig deeper on any of these approaches. So this is an image of Buckminster Fuller leading a class at Black Mountain College. Free International University, 1971, their manifesto was co-written by artist Joseph Boyce. Fritz Haig's Sundown Schoolhouse, run out of his home in Los Angeles, which then later became the Los Angeles Seminary for Civic and Embodied Arts. Mountain School of Art in LA. The Alternative Art College in London. Trade School in New York. Bruce High Quality Foundation University, also in New York. Close to home, we have COPS, the Conceptual Oregon Performance School. And last, but certainly not least, the terminology that artist Victor Maldonado introduced me to, the Invisible College, the network of peers and friends that you learn from and with, often informally. I'm going to come to a close this morning by sharing an anecdote with you about a conference that I attended last month in Cleveland. Uh, members from BFA, MFA, PhD were also presenting at the conference and they shared a lot of their research. During the Q&A portion, someone from the audience asked an inflamed question about who their target is. The person was concerned that the end goal of the group was the closure of art schools. BFA, MFA, PhD ensured that that was indeed not their goal and that they were in no way interested in mass layoffs and tenured faculty losing their jobs. That night over dinner, someone at my table knew the woman in the audience who had made the comment and she said, it's just so important, so important that she said that, you know, especially since the group was presenting in the context of an art school. So I'm going to paraphrase to you what I said in response. This is not about targets and takedowns. This is about options. What we really need is to change our structures of value so that we can respect and acknowledge other approaches to education, whether that be free school, self-taught, community-based, or other. We need to get to a place culturally where we truly value education and knowledge over purchasing power. Thank you.